following announcements. August 7th, Anne's Closet will be open from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Uh, the August 9th Night Circle meeting um, has been canceled. August 10th, the trustees of the church and Parsons will do a, uh, a walkthrough of the grounds. Uh, upcoming events, uh, August 11th, we'll have a prayer over the preschool immediately following worship service. August 13th, the Andorra Circle meeting at 1030. August 15th, bingo at 10.30 a.m. August 16th, another family game night at 6 p.m. And from now until, uh, from now through August 18th, we'll be collecting school supplies and food for fuel in lieu of a back to school bash. You are invited and encouraged to bring any or all of the following. There is a list. Uh, please be sure to check expiration dates on food items. On September 1st, we will begin a 12-week church-wide dive into what it means to be United Methodists. Together, we will read the book Upward by Steve Harper and Dr. Paul Chilcote. The church office will place an order for the books on August 19th. If you would like to order the book through the church, the cost is $15. Please designate your check or envelope. If cost is prohibitive, there are funds available to assist with the purchase of the book. Please reach out to Pastor Corey for more information. Upper rooms are available at either sanctuary entrance to count your daily devotional. And as always, please fill out the attendance pad at the end of your pew to let us know you were with us in worship this morning. Good morning. A few additional notes. First is that our 12-week series will not just be reading the book. We will be reading the book. We will also be using it to guide our worship, and so I will be preaching on it. We'll be reading it together and having discussion on Wednesday nights in Bible study. And I know that Wednesday nights don't work for everyone, and so I'm also in the process of finding some different times for other groups to meet so that we are all engaging and reading this book together and having important discussions. Another quick note about the prayer next week. It will be maybe five extra minutes after worship. Our preschool will be back in session on Monday, August 12th, and I personally have been counting down the days to that date. And so on the Sunday before, we are going to go in and we will say a prayer over the space. We will pray for our director and for our teachers and for our students and for their parents and guardians. And so I hope that you will join me just through these doors for a few minutes after worship next week. Finally, and like I did last week, I just want to note that our scripture today has some very difficult themes. Um, this week, we kind of, we continue the story of David and Bathsheba. And so, just as a trigger warning, I offer you the space to take the space that you need, that you will not offend me if you need to leave because I recognize that while it's important to hear scripture, sometimes that scripture is hard to hear. And while it's important that we sit with that, it is also important that we listen to our bodies and our minds. So with all of that being said, I say to you now that whether this is your first time or you've been attending for years, whether you're strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Family of God, what is our story? We are part of the Family of God, what is our story? The Lord created by our loving God, we have sinned and harmed ourselves, one another, and creation. Family of God, what is our story? While we were dead sinners, God sent Jesus to show us how to turn away from the sins and enjoy the love of God. 
family of God, what is our story? Family of God, this is our story and our song. Be Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing together hymn number 357, Just As I Am Without One Thing. to continue standing as you're able as we affirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. Let us pray. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Take this patchwork collection of persons and quilt together your church. Like old pieces of cloth, take these words and songs and prayers. Take our thoughts and inner hungers and join them all together in a new and living fabric. The purpose of which is to cover and color your world, or at least our corner of it, with grace and love in Christ. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing together hymn number 390, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. this morning in 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 26, through chapter 12, verse 13a. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, 
the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Every week for the last several weeks that we've been in Second Samuel, as I've listened to the scripture be read, I think, what was I thinking? <laughs> the last two weeks, as in this week and last week, have not been particularly fun weeks of scripture. Last week, we heard the story of David God's chosen leader, Israel's greatest king, the royal leader who is said to have written many of the Psalms, has committed a terrible, has committed several terrible sins. While his army was out on the battlefield, David from his from his castle glimpses Bathsheba and desired her and took her as if she were his own. She, of course, was not. And so David's adultery is just this classic case of a powerful man having his way with a powerless woman. And that there is enough. But David goes on. He plots to get rid of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, even as Uriah was faithfully serving David's army. He had put Uriah at the front of the battle to be sure he was killed. But then Bathsheba bears a child from that was conceived during a rape by David. And what we didn't hear today is that the child dies. And so now we pick up with where our scripture today begins. David almost got away with it. 
he paid the hush money. He lied about or blamed his actions on the woman. He also might have just tried to deny it or stonewall it, and he might have gotten away with it. But then Nathan comes in. Nathan comes in and says, let me tell you a story. There was a rich man who had many sheep. There was a poor man who had nothing but one little lamb, which he loved as if it was his, were his child. The rich man desired the lamb, and so he stole it, killed it, and served it as a dish. King David, upon hearing the story, had, I think, the appropriate reaction that we all likely have. This is outrageous. I tell you, as God is my witness, the rich, powerful man who did this shall be severely punished. I will. But Nathan interrupts. You are that man. Nathan reels David in. David takes the bait. David might have gotten away from it, gotten away with it, except for the fact that the same God who graciously made David king is also a God of truth. And so what Nathan is doing for David, what Nathan is doing for Israel, what Nathan is doing for us, is speaking truth into power. Power is something that I think we are all too familiar with. It's this illusion that it is autonomous and self-sufficient. Powerful people in powerful positions often imagine they can define reality in their own terms. And in many ways, we see that happening. And David has succumbed to the illusion of his royal reality as ultimate authority. But Nathan comes in to speak to him the truth of the matter, that there is a divine reality before which royal reality will be judged. And in our own time, here and now, the prophetic task is still to speak the truth of divine reality in a world that is obsessed with the self-defining realities of political and economic power. And so if the church is willing to speak prophetically as part of its ministry, then it must be willing to speak the truth in the presence of power. And sometimes the presence of power is the church itself. I think about the church's complacency throughout, the throughout history, really, but I recently finished a book about the church's complacency throughout and its support of slavery and segregation and the Jim Crow laws and throughout civil rights. Throughout this era, the church distorted the gospel to create policies that solidified systems of oppression. Systems that we still see at play today. Bye. 
that's the closest he's ever gotten to actually making it up to me in the pulpit. So. Yes. Yeah, next time Rosie's going to give him directions to get, <laughs> to get to me better. We see throughout history that the church tends to side with those in power. And we see this on a large scale like the United Methodist Church and its divisions when the South elected a bishop who owned enslaved Africans, who owned people. They split, and we got the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. We have also seen this split happening over the last several years as we have, as we have navigated disaffiliations and people leaving the church over human sexuality. We have seen these places where the church is aligning with those who can keep it in power. And while this happens on a broad level, it also happens on a smaller level. I have a clergy friend who was serving a congregation in a small town, and he was making decisions as the pastor that some of the congregants very much disagreed with. And so as he entered his third year of ministry with them, he knew it would be their last because he was unwilling to fight against those in power who were manipulating the church in the way that they could by changing their finances. <laughs> and so we see these power grabs even within a local church because we want to cling to the ways we've always done things. We want to cling to the things that are familiar, the things that keep us feeling like we have control. When the reality is we have very little control over anything. And the places that I always find the most hope. The places that keep me coming back to the church. The places that give Life and hope are the places where we see the church gathering together to speak truth into power. Back in February, 70 members of the Tennessee Western Kentucky Conference joined other Tennesseans in Nashville for a day on the hill for gun reform. There were representatives from numerous communities and advocacy groups, faith traditions, and cities across Tennessee to gather in one voice to advocate for gun reform and increased gun safety. The day began at McKendry United Methodist Church downtown where community members and survivors of gun violence spoke on the importance of policy changes around the issue. The group then marched to Legislative Plaza across from the State Capitol building for a press conference and rally. And after lunch, people joined their teams to listen in on committee meetings, pass out educational literature, and speak with elected officials. That is speaking truth into power. That is taking the gospel of Christ who also spoke truth into power 
so that we might experience a safer community, so that we might begin to repent of our sin of complicity and we begin to see that our voices matter. And part of this is recognizing the places where we fall short. When we celebrate Holy Communion in a few minutes, we will confess of our sin and seek forgiveness. And so we will pray that prayer together, the prayer that says we are sorry for the times that we have fallen short. And so this morning, I'm going to close with a different prayer of confession that was written by Myra Laidlaw. Let us pray. Merciful God, we hear the story of David and wonder how he could so abuse his power, serving his own interests in such a selfish way. How different from the way Jesus used his power, serving, healing, and nurturing others. Forgive us when our actions reflect those of David more than those of Jesus. The account of David shows someone yielding to temptation by feeding his own particular hunger with disastrous results. Whilst Jesus took time to feed the crowds with miraculous results. Forgive us the times when we have yielded to the temptation of feeding our own interests to the detriment of others around us. David demonstrated how things can get out of control when God's rules are not followed, while Jesus demonstrates how God's power can be bring peace even into the stormiest situations. We confess that the way of the world does not reflect more. We confess that the way of the world does reflect more the way of David than the way of Jesus. And we pray that we may be powerfully strengthened by the Holy Spirit to witness Jesus' love and compassion in and through all we do and say. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. So hear and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. Let us pray. O God, pour out your spirit upon these, our gifts, gifts that have been graciously given to us that we now humbly return to you. May they be used to further your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, our full prayer list can be found on the back of the bulletin. Are there any joys or concerns we would like to lift up this morning? Welcome. We want to keep. We want to keep Welta's sister in our prayers. She has been to church here a few times. We she is going through several different things. I didn't type, catch what, but we want to keep her in our prayers. She's doing one biopsy and a PET scan. She's having a lung biopsy and a PET scan. So we keep her in our prayers. Robert. We want to keep Robert in our prayers. He had two cousins pass away this week. So we keep their families in our prayers. Donna. We give thanks for those who have returned after years away and those who are attending for the first time. The people who have been here for a long time know that I say this a lot, but I really do mean the welcome statement at the beginning. Whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you might have been gone for a few years and are coming back, you are welcome, and it is a joy to be in worship with you all today. We want to keep Andrew Clark in our prayers. He has a sore throat, and so we pray that it is not anything more than just a sore throat and like, a little, and a nap won't take care of it. <laughs> Janice, I would like to give prayers to my cousin Linda. She just lost our sister, and she's really having a rough time. So we need to keep her in our prayers, please. We want to keep Linda in our prayers. She is Janice's cousin, and she, last week we announced the Diane McGregor had passed away, and so Linda is Diane's sister, and so we keep her in our prayers as she continues through the grief process of losing her sister. Are there any others? Let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. For another day to gather together, to wrestle with your word, to be in community with one another. Oh God, as this community, as your people, we offer up our prayer to you. We pray. We pray for those dealing with grief and loss. We pray for those waiting for test results in appointments. We pray for healing for those who 
aren't feeling their best this day. Oh God, we give you thanks that you hear these, our prayers. You hear the ones we have shared aloud with one another. And you hear the ones that remain deep within our hearts. The ones that are beyond words. The ones we are unready to share. Oh God, we lift these things and all things to you in your son's holy name. Amen. As we prepare to come to the table, we are reminded that this is not my table. This is not St. Bethlehem's table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And at Christ's table, all are welcome, all are invited, and all are celebrated. This morning, we will be using the fun little cups to take communion, and so you will be invited forward to kneel at the altar, and our communion servers will serve you the bread and the cup, and you're invited to partake in the elements. I will dismiss each group with a blessing, and then you're invited to return to your seat. Any money that is left on the altar goes to our Helping Hands Fund, which goes to assist our neighbors in need. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. Yes. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through prophets and teachers. 
In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus Christ who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace a people as your own and fill them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and grains, as the grain and grapes once dispersed in the fields are now united on this table as bread and wine, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one loaf. The bread which we break is sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite those assisting with communion to come forward.
table is set and you are invited. forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together hymn number 369, Blessed Assurance. It is full of sin. It is happy and joyful and beautiful and complicated. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. 